Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. It's part of the National PTAC Day series of events. PTAC Day was yesterday and this is the third webinar in the series. And um, this webinar, uh, all right, um, I believe I'm getting some clicks from Yuri here. So, all right, uh, it's called Behind the Curtain on Federal Small Business Set-Asides. And we are very lucky to have two folks from the SBA who are going to be helping us out today. My name is James Forrest. I'm the program coordinator for NorCal PTAC. And we've got Yuri Dyson, Procurement Center Representative for the Office of Government Contracting, Area 6, and Aaron Para, from the, uh, also Procurement Analyst from Office of Government Contracting, Area 6 as well. So uh, I'm going to hand things over to them pretty quickly. If you've been to these webinars before, you know that I'd like to just say a little bit about PTAC, the PTAC program and what we do. And I'm gonna talk a bit about PTACs in general across the country. So happy PTAC day, um, a little belated, but still there are 94 PTACs across the country. PTAC stands for Procurement Technical Assistance Centers. This is a, a program that was created by Congress, I believe in the seventies or eighties. Um, and basically the idea is to provide assistance to businesses, especially small businesses um, to help them compete in the government marketplace. So we want your business to succeed. Um, all of our services are no cost. We don't charge anything. We're funded by federal, state, and local grants as well as contracts. In 2019, PTACs across the country served over 57,000 clients and helped them win more than 24 billion with a B in government contracts and subcontracts. Um, so we are definitely a great resource across the whole country. Here's the map in uh, just California. And you can see that there are uh, seven PTACs plus the American Indian PTAC. And so uh, these are resources available to you if you're in California, but they're across the country. So we'll give you a link here on the next page. I'm gonna talk about our own PTAC, but if you see that link at the bottom, aptac-us.org slash find a PTAC, uh, that you, you can go to that webpage, click on your state. There's a drop down menu. Um, and you'll see all the counties and all the PTACs in your state with contact information. It's pretty cool. That is your launching point. Then you can get started and just click on um, whatever website it is. And typically there's an online application or if you have any questions, you can reach out the phone number. Um, that's our website there, norcalptac.org. And uh, that's how you get started with us. You can submit an application. Um, so why would you submit an application for PTAC aside from uh, winning government contracts? The nitty gritty of it is basically that we offer one-on-one -on -one counseling and custom bid matching to our clients. Um, this is something that's only available if you apply um, online or if you request a phone uh, intake. Um, and so we have, a, we have a team of procurement specialists that are counselors. And when you apply, we will re respond to you with their contact information if you are approved for a, a beginning session. And then you can meet with them, set up a meeting and go over whatever processes that you're struggling with or you'd like some guidance on how to sell your goods and services to the government. And when I say government, it could be city, county, local, tribal, state, federal, um, all sorts of branches of the government buy things. Um, government buys just about anything you can think of. And we are here uh, to help you navigate those systems. Um, so uh, that can be, you know, uh, doing marketplace research, looking for bids, you know, finding opportunities, how to prepare a proposal, compliance once you're set up. There's uh, getting your certifications, of course, is kind of the first step, getting you registered in SAM, getting your DUNS number, all sorts of things we can help with. Pretty much if it has to do with government contracting, um, we're likely to be able to help with it. Um, and then the other thing is we can set up a custom bid matching profile. You work with your procurement specialist, create some criteria that suits what you sell, and then put it in a system that will aggregate uh, as much as it can from out on the internet and then send it to your inbox in the morning. And that's a nice way to stay on top of those opportunities. So those are just for our client base. You have to be in our service area and you have to apply and you have to have an established business. So our service area here is on the right. You can see those 15 counties in green. Um, if you apply from outside of the service area, I will unfortunately reject and refer you to another PTAC. So do check to make sure you're in one of those counties before submitting an application. Um, but it doesn't matter where you are for resources and trainings like the ones we have today. So that's the third thing we do, as you know, because you're here today, we put on trainings constantly. Um, and so these are free. 
uh, both financially and then also in terms of geographic area and business status. Uh, we don't care where you're coming from. We would like to help you out with these trainings. Um, so the client base is for folks in the service area. The trainings are for anybody. So uh, go ahead and apply on our website if you're in the service area. If you're not in our service area, that's the link at the bottom to aptac-us. All right, I think it is time to hand things over. Um, and there's just a dis disclosure here saying that the presenters um, believe that this is accurate as of now. It is September 16th, 2021. Um, we are recording the session for later, so um, it could be changed, things change. Uh, but let's go ahead and hand things over to our presenter. Uh, Yuri Dyson is gonna take things from here to start things off. Um, I just also wanna note that if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, it's better if you put them in the Q&A and not the chat, because the Q&A allows us to follow along and sort of track the questions, um, but feel free to network in the chat. Um, once again, we are recording this, the slides as well as the video recording will be shared with everybody and posted to our website uh, later today. All right, Yuri, go ahead and take it away. Go unmuting and starting my video. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Yuri Dyson. I'm a procurement center representative with the SBA. I happen to sit in the Portland area, but my service area includes uh, part of Northern California. So that's why um, I'm here today. And, and Aaron also services part of that area too. He'll introduce himself. Um, just wanted to let you know that um, uh, this is just a little bit of my background here. I'm a former federal contracting officer. I've been doing federal contracts for almost 30 years. And um, so I, I do know the processes that uh, you'll be facing as a prospective bidder on federal contracts. And um, I use that knowledge, um, I like to say for good, to help you all understand that process better and be able to compete better um, against large businesses and other small businesses. There's a lot of different techniques um, involved in doing that, a lot of things to know. And so I'm really glad that you're already connected with PTAC, even if today is your first day in doing so, because PTACs are a powerhouse in terms of helping you learn the rope with these different processes. And it's, it's definitely a huge education. Even though I've been in federal contracting for decades, I still don't know everything. And there's still things that come up every day that are um, that are new and things that we have to research and, and uh, talk with colleagues about. So please don't feel at all like um, you're, you're too much of a newbie. There's um, a lot of help out there. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and change the slide. Let's see here. I'm gonna stop, let's see. So sorry, I think I'm, I'm forgetting how to switch control of the presentation here. I'm gonna share the screen again and show you the slideshow. There we go, and I should be able to advance the slides. There we go. Here's a slide on Aaron. Aaron, do you wanna say a few words about yourself? Um, sure, hello everybody. Um, Aaron, now I'm, I'm located in the LA area, but we do cover um, NorCal as well. We kind of split the territory up, Yuri and I. I've been a PCR for about 10 years now. Um, prior to that, I, I've been around a little bit. Um, NASA JPL, DCMA, I also worked for a contractor on the other side of the desk, but um, that feels like a lifetime ago. So mostly I've been in this, uh, this PCR role for the better part of my career. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, let's get on with the information at hand. I'm gonna show you, making sure there's not a delay after I click buttons. There we go. All right, so behind the curtain, and I, I, I titled it this way because I think there's always a bit of a mis mystery um, when the public thinks about what goes on at the federal agencies when they make some of their um, buying decisions. So let's just go ahead and jump on in. 
Um, so just a quick word about the part of SBA that Aaron and I work in. Um, it's the SBA Office of Government Contracting. It's a specific arm of the SBA that's separate from the district offices that you might already be familiar with. Um, we focus on the, on the different ways that the federal agencies that buy um, services and goods for the federal government, whether or not they're following the federal rules about that. Um, as you probably know, there's goals involved at the federal level for awarding to small business and different socioeconomic categories. So we're actually um, kind of there at the SBA uh, liaising with those federal buying agencies. We're giving them training. We're giving them technical assistance with use of those programs. And we also help with uh, firms like yourselves who are interested in entering that marketplace or are, might be having issues with some of those small business rules. Um, so we do things like size determinations to verify whether or not firms really are small. Um, we have ways to check with the um, small business subcontracting programs, making sure that the large primes are adequately using small businesses and a whole host of other things that we could go on and on about. But let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. This is just a quick map to show you how we're organized. The um, SBA Office of Government Contracting, we're in areas. So you noticed on the slides for myself and Aaron, we're in area six. And that's pretty much everything um, along the West Coast, including Alaska, Hawaii, and Guam. Um, so that's how we're broken up. Uh, our area, we're, we're very tight with one another. We work uh, very closely with one another. And so even if, um, let's say my background is pretty heavy in reforestation type contracts because I, um, I've lived and worked in Oregon all my life. Um, if there's a colleague of mine, say in Arizona, who's not as familiar with reforestation contracts, she might call on me to, um, to quiz me on that or vice versa. So um, we always pull from one another and we can pull from the other areas too if we need, need that expertise. So, um, so I mentioned a bit earlier about the small business goals. So oftentimes, um, no, usually after uh, fall of each year, you'll begin to hear about whether or not the federal agencies met their small business goals. And typically by maybe quarter two in the fiscal calendar, quarter one starts October 1st, um, you may start hearing about whether or not um, the, the numbers coming in really do look like they made those goals. Um, it's 23% of the contract dollars that have to go to small businesses. And this is across the federal marketplace. 5% um, to women, 5% to socially disadvantaged, 3% to service disabled, and 3% to hub zones. Um, now, just a quick little, um, quick little uh, uh, lesson on the small business programs, because you may not be familiar with all of them. Um, Women-owned small businesses are uh, small firms to begin with that are owned and controlled um, at least 51% by a woman or women. And um, there was recently a big change in the women-owned small business program on the federal level. Um, we used to allow self-certifications and the business owners would upload their proof documents to a repository that SBA managed. Now it's, uh, as of last fall, it's been turned into a formal certification program where the business has to submit a um, pretty detailed package uh, about themselves to the SBA, which is then reviewed and um, hopefully approved. Then uh, there's a profile online that SBA manages where it will show that you've actually been granted that certification. And that's where the federal agencies go to verify that you're truly certified in the program. Um, so that's, that's women-owned small business. There's also a subset of it for economically disadvantaged. If your income and asset levels uh, meet certain requirements, um, then you can be designated as economically disadvantaged. Socially disadvantaged small businesses are typically those that are owned by individuals uh, from uh, who are members of various um, uh, racial or ethnic groups. Um, it could also be individuals who um, are disabled or maybe um, lived in extremely remote locations. Um, essentially, the premise here is that these socially disadvantaged populations did not have 
the same access uh, potentially to education, training, um, business opportunities as others. So um, this is where uh, this program is set up and um, a subset of this is the 8A program, which you might have heard about. Service disabled veteran owned small businesses is just that, it's small businesses owned by veterans who have a service connected disability. And so it's important for these individuals to make sure that they uh, have at hand um, their service disabled uh, proof documents should they ever need to be um, proving that. HUBZone is, uh, stands for Historically Underutilized Business Zone. That happens to do, uh, deal with firms that are located in parts of the country, could be counties, census tracts, um, maybe specific little bits of those census tracts that are um, economically depressed, essentially. Has nothing to do with one's color, one's um, you know, uh, ethnic group or anything or gender or anything like that. It's strictly dealing with where that business is located. And it's a means to try and uh, spur economic activity in, in with, for businesses that are located in areas that need that help. So all of these programs you see here have set aside uh, regulations, uh, regulations that allow the federal agencies to set particular contracts aside for these groups if the um, agencies can verify that there are uh, sufficient numbers of these people in, in that area or in that group. So um, this is where, you know, we're talking about behind the curtain. How do the agencies make those decisions? And that's what we'll talk about some more. Okay. All right. So um, this is going to be a bit like a fire hose. So please, um, please just sit back, let this wash over you and feel free to watch the video again or feel free to contact us if you've got questions. But um, when you think about all these different programs, there's, there's actually no order of precedence among them. If there's no policy in the Fed that says that agencies have to use this one first and this one second. The only um, uh, exception to that is if there are contracts over the simplified acquisition threshold, that's what SAT means, simplified acquisition threshold. Um, if there are procurements over that amount, then what the regulations say is that the agency must first consider the socioeconomic set-asides before doing um, what we sometimes call a plain vanilla uh, small business set-aside. That's because it's a, it's a bigger, um, uh, maybe more um, uh, profitable or maybe more um, lucrative, perhaps, contract. We want to target those um, target consideration to the socioeconomic groups first. So this is just to get you familiar with what the different rules are that the buyers are having to follow. So these goals can vary. Um, you know, the, the first slide I showed you with the goals of 23%, 5%, 3%, those are top line goals for the federal agencies overall. Um, if we kind of zoom in a little bit, the, um, each of the di different uh, departments, each of the different agencies have a specific set of goals of their own that are developed custom uh, matching their mission, where they typically operate, what types of things they usually buy. Um, so as you can see here, defense, for example, they usually have a 22% small business prime contracts goal and a 33% small business subcontracting goal. And yes, we do have, um, subcontracting goals for each of these agencies as well, um, because we know full well that not everything can go small business. So when we um, have prime contractors that are large and are awarded those larger contracts, we insert uh, rules that say that those firms also have to subcontract to a certain percent with small businesses and the other socioeconomic groups. So as you can see here, based on the different agencies, the, the percentages are gonna vary. And this goes on down into the um, uh, socioeconomic goals as well. So let me show you a scorecard. We have these scorecards available on our website. You can go to that link at the bottom to check those out. The latest ones we have available are from 2020. This happens to be the one for Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, as you can see, it's, it's kind of like a report card. They actually get a grade. But for Veterans Affairs, their 2020 goals are listed here. 
So the socioeconomic goals, um, they're pretty much the standard goals, five or 3%, but they have a small business goal of 28.16. Here you can see under the achievement um, column on the far right, how they actually did in FY 2020. Um, and then for comparison purposes, you can see how they did the year before. For subcontracting, you can see the lower half of this, <clears throat> of this screen, and it gives you an idea, um, which could be useful for you because perhaps the way your business is set up, maybe the things that you provide are not likely to be bought under a prime contract by the federal agencies. In that case, you might actually fit very well as a subcontractor to a large prime getting a federal contract. So this part of the scorecard could be very useful for you because you can see if a particular agency might be struggling in a category that you happen to be eligible for, okay? So what if an agency does not meet their small business goals? That's, that's kind of um, a question that we get commonly. Um, you know, what's, what's the hook? What's the, um, what's the stick versus the carrot? So um, I'm going to let uh, Aaron take over here. He's going to share uh, what happens in that case. And um, let's see here, and away we go. Aaron, are you all set? Yep. And I believe you just granted me access. So let's get going. <clears throat> So if an agency fails to meet its goals, and, and one thing to keep in mind is that most agencies will flow down goals um, that can be different or they can be in line with the, with the department at a top level. So Department of Defense will flow down a goal to all the different branches, and then the Air Force will take that and will flow down a, flow down a goal to all their different MAGCOMs, and then the MAGCOMs will flow down a goal to all their different bases. They could all be different. Um, so if uh, if an agency fails to meet its goal, um, we we have a meeting with their OSDEVU, Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization, um, to talk about what happened, what went wrong, what were the circumstances. Sometimes there's a change in budget that's outside of everybody's control. Um, of course, that, that happens a lot, actually. Um, there are maybe some congressional inquiries. Um, we certainly review any actions that SBA has taken or can take to assist them in meeting their goals and providing training on policies and procedures and general practices. Um, and PCRs, so Yuri and I, we, we can become much more involved, especially if the failure to meet the goal was at the um, individual base or office level where, where we kind of operate Right, we don't really operate at the department level like the Department of Defense headquarters. We operate at the individual level, like Edwards Air Force Base, for example. Um, so we'll work more closely with them if they fa fail to meet their goals. We'll review their documentation more thoroughly. Um, we may set up different review thresholds. We have a lot of tools at our disposal. We can also perform surveillance reviews, and we do perform surveillance reviews, especially if an agency isn't meeting their goal. Um, surveillance review is what we call our audits. Um, so a team of two or three PCRs, Yuri and I have done um, one or two surveillance reviews together. Um, we will go in and we will pull a selection of about 30, 40 different contracts, and we will review them for uh, completeness and for evidence that they've taken small businesses into consideration in, as part of their procurement process. Uh, we'll evaluate the overall impact of their small business program because every individual base or office, uh, sometimes uh, they call them uh, agencies with an organic warrant activity, I, I believe that's what it's called. Um, they have to have a small business program. Usually that's run at the local level. So they'll have a small business specialist on site that's in charge of running the program and making sure that they meet their goals and making sure that they provide small businesses access to doing business with that base. Um, so we'll assess the overall 
quality of the program at that activity. Identify any best practices. Certainly surveillance reviews aren't always negative. Sometimes we go in there and find they're doing a lot of things uh, correctly and maybe they are meeting most of their goals. Uh, maybe this year was a setback. Um, that does happen. We also make any recommendations that we feel would strengthen their program. Generally, we do about 30 uh, procurement centers um, in a year. They're, they're not 30 in area six, but just 30 across government contracting. If you go back to the map, we do have coast to coast coverage and uh, coast to coast and then some Hawaii, Guam, Puerto Rico. Um, so we, we will do surveillance review audits every single year. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag with the, with the slides. So these are some of the categories of compliance that we review. Um, use of 8A contracts, use of socioeconomic set-asides, especially if they aren't meeting their socioeconomic goals. We want to see um, why, and if they're not awarding socioeconomic set-asides, well, that, that could be an issue. And, and so why? It could be that there are some misconceptions about the program, that um, a perception that it's difficult to use or that there are not enough vendors. So we will do training on those areas to kind of bring them up to speed if that's what they need. Um, subcontracting, how much they're doing to increase subcontracting on base. Are they monitoring the goals of the large primes with subcontracting plans? Um, other small business issues, of course, the use, is, uh, use of the regulatory clauses and provisions. Bundling is a big one. That's where they take contracts that were being performed by a small business, put them together and make a contract so large that basically only a large business can do. That's a big deal. Um, and any other best practices, as we already mentioned. Now, amongst these categories, there are certain things that I like to look for in particular. If they use an outdated clause or they forgot to include a certain clause on um, something that's already set aside for small business, yeah, we'll call it out and we'll, we'll let them know that there may be an issue with the clause matrix that they're using and we'll let them know that perhaps it wasn't done correctly. But the way I see it, that doesn't really prohibit a small business from participating in the contracts on that base, whereas bundling, for example, does, or poor market research, um, failure to provide sources sought, that sort of thing. So anything that really limits a small business's ability to participate and creates a barrier to entry, it's kind of huge. That's, that's a lot of what we base our grade on. And, um, these are some of the grades that we assigned. Um, we have recommended a couple of outstandings in the past. There are some agencies that are doing very, very well and we'll call out their best practices and we'll kind of make a, make a positive example out of them. Um, so these aren't always uh, punitive. Um, highly satisfactory, um, satisfactory. And again, this is where, as objective as we try to be in assigning these ratings, this is where a little subjectivity gets into the process. For example, if a lot of their findings are um, administrative, like clauses versus something that really limits participation, we kind of weigh those against each other. Um, marginally satisfactory and unsatisfactory requires a follow-up surveillance review the following fiscal year. If it's a marginally satisfactory uh, rating, the follow-up has to be performed by the area director. Um, that's, that's, that would be our boss, Yuri and I. Um, and if you go back to the map, uh, I'm gonna be referencing the map more than once, but if you go back to the map, all six areas have a director. Um, so if there's an agency that got a marginally sat, the area director has to go out and perform the review. If it's an unsatisfactory, the director from headquarters, um, the director of government contracting who sits above the six area directors, um, he has to go out and perform the review himself. So we take those very seriously. And if the agency fails again, we will be back on their doorstep.
the following fiscal year. And I've been a part of those reviews where it's the third time SBA has gone out there to see if their issues have been corrected. Um, the goal is eventually for them to get a satisfactory. Satisfactory is a passing grade as far as we're concerned. So market research is very important because it drives everything. Everything starts with the market research. That's what determines whether something should be set aside or whether it's even appropriate for a set aside. Um, every contracting action has to have adequate market research. Now, of course, you see in the third bullet, um, it has to be appropriate to the circumstance. Uh, there's a phrase you hear a lot, how much money do you want to spend spending the money? Um, of course, a five figure buy may not be treated the same way as a eight figure buy or a billion dollar buy, which I have seen. Um, but there does need to be market research. It does need to be documented. It needs to be put in the file. And in many cases, it's reviewed by a PCR um, for, for accuracy, for completeness. It's the contracting officer's primary responsibility to perform market research or the contract specialist, but also it can be done in conjunction with their clients, their requirement personnel, um, their technical staff, uh, the small business specialists located on site, um, or the SBA PCR will jump in and help on occasion. Um, small business specialist uh, is internal to an agency. So SBA PCRs, we work for the SBA, we're an, in, we're an independent agency. We don't sit under the Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, or any of those, right? We're fully independent. Small business specialists will work for the local base that they're assigned to. Um, I mentioned Edwards Air, For Air Force Base earlier. So Edwards Air Force Base has two small business specialists that sit on site. They are our liaisons with that agency. Um, rather than work with all the individual contracting officers, generally the lines of communication are through the PCR to the small business specialist and, and vice versa. There is some overlap in what we do, but we are given special authority to push back and to create set-asides that they don't have. Um, and also they are beholden to their agency, which we are not. So it's a very subtle difference, but it's a very, very important distinction. Anyway, we do work very closely with them. Some of the agency considerations and some of the things that we take into consideration when reviewing these um, acquisition packages that we receive are the procurement history. Was there a set aside done last time? And if so, why can't a set aside be done this time? Um, is there additional market information elsewhere within the agency? Um, sometimes uh, some agencies will have different branches. NAFAC in particular has NAFAC Southwest, Northwest, Atlantic. Um, and even within NAFAC Southwest, which is located in San Diego, they have offices all throughout the state of California that manage their construction contracts on site. So sometimes there is, uh, there's something to be said for no local knowledge of the area uh, to determine what really is feasible for a set aside and what is not. Uh, sources SOTs are one of my favorite methods of doing market research is when they put out a source of SOT notice and allow industry to come in and, and it's, it's industry's opportunity to say, hey, you know, I can do it. And um, here are my capabilities. And this is why, you know, I think I'm a good fit. And if they collect enough source of SOT responses from small business or from, from qualified small businesses, it gives them a lot of ammunition to create set-asides. And it gives Yuri and I a lot of ammunition to push set-asides. Um, if I review uh, an acquisition package that they're trying to release unrestricted large business, um, and there are lots of source of SOT responses from small businesses, that's kind of the number one way I can push back and create a set aside. So responding to source of SOT notices is very important. Okay, I'm, I, I know I've been talking a lot about it, 
but I hear this misconception from agency or from, from contractors that say, well, once the source of SOT notice is out there, they already know who they're going with. It's not true. Okay. I'm not saying that they don't ever try to like rig it so that they get their preferred candidate, but um, that's where Yuri and I step in to ensure that there's compliance. Um, very, very important. There are always, you know, bad actors, but generally that's not the norm. I don't, I don't want to discourage anybody. So the rule of two, very important. You're going to hear that a lot in contracting in general. Um, oh, pardon me. Um, anytime that there's a reasonable expectation that offers will be obtained from at least two responsible small business sources and the award will be made at fair market price. Um, very important. Without those two things, we, we do not pass go. Um, once those two bullet points are satisfied, if there is a reasonable expectation that there are two or more small businesses that can perform the work, the contract should be set aside. Okay. It shall be set aside, in fact. Um, very, very important. So fair market price, that's determined by the independent uh, government estimate. They should have an estimate of what this, this, this is going to cost. If it's well above that, that that could mean that the estimate is bad. Of course, that does happen. But um, if, if there's kind of not, if, if they're a little more certain about what this should cost, because maybe there's procurement history as well, and there's no fair market price, the set aside can be dissolved. If uh, some of those firms aren't found to be responsible, meaning um, that the contracting officer cannot determine that they have the capability to perform because say it's a construction firm and this is a contract for supplying um, tires, vehicle parts, responsibility comes into question there. And I do see some questions popping up here and there. Yuri and I are gonna address those at the end. Oh, okay. Pardon me. So if you're a firm with um, any socioeconomic certification uh, or, or not, even just plain vanilla small businesses, 23% of contracts have to be awarded to small business. That's not for every individual socioeconomic concern. So total small businesses get the pretty much the largest slice of the pie. Um, positive past performance. Lack of past performance should be neutral, but certainly if you have positive past performance, uh, adequate bonding, um, your registration's fully complete and you have a good up-to-date capability statement, you can reach out to uh, your, your friendly PTAC or SBA PCR and we can help you with your marketing a bit. And as a matter of fact, I recognize some of the participants on the call, they've reached out to me recently and I've kind of pointed them in, in the right direction and helped them with their approach. Usually the person you want to reach out to when it comes to marketing is the small business specialist. They're, they're the liaison for the contracting officers. They should be well aware of their forecast and their requirements. Um, I find them, especially in our service area, California, to be exceptionally knowledgeable. We're, we're pretty fortunate in this area. A lot of our small business specialists and a lot of our agencies are really good. There we go. Pardon me, a little bit of a delay in the slides, uh, at least on my end. Um, so how you can assist in creating set-asides is responding to source of SOT notices. Like I said, very important. It's very difficult for an agency to tell us that something needs to be released unrestricted when the industry has shown up small businesses in particular have shown up and responded to the source of SOT, responding to any requests for information on data.san.gov or um, 
participating in site visits and industry days. There are really kind of two, two kinds of industry days. There are the general sort of expo where an agency opens its doors and allows small businesses to come in and they'll discuss their acquisition forecast or what industry they, they kind of expect to spend a lot of their money in, you know, whether or transportation or IT. Um, and when they can expect those um, solicitations to hit the street. And then there are industry days that are very, very focused to one particular solicitation. Like for example, if the Army Corps of Engineers wants to build a massive, uh, you know, uh, let's just say an eight story parking lot, something huge, they'll invite industry to come out on site and uh, kind of explore the site and they'll discuss, uh, allow industry to answer, to ask questions, have their questions answered. Um, and it's very tailored to a project. But be on the lookout for just even the open house type of industry days. Those are really important. I encourage everybody to attend those, of course, right now. Some of them aren't in person. Some of them are, are most are virtual, I guess. Some are transitioning to in-person industry days, but those are really important. You, you get your face in front of the contracting officers and the program management people there that are that are influential. So it's essentially free marketing other than the cost to attend. Um, they, they, they don't usually charge a fee to attend rather, but the costs incurred in transportation for you. Bidding on projects that are not small business set asides, don't be discouraged because if you as a small business win a contract that's unrestricted, maybe the next time there's a requirement, then they'll limit the, uh, the scope of competition to small businesses. So now you're playing in a much smaller pool. Um, lots of small businesses win unrestricted contracts just because something's full and open or unrestricted. We use, we use those terms interchangeably. Um, doesn't mean that you're not gonna win it. And we understand that your time and energy is limited. Um, it's a business decision, ultimately, how many sources sought notices you wanna respond to. Um, work with your PTAC, or if you're in the 8A program, work with your business opportunity specialist, or work with um, any, um, you know, um, any, of our, any of our free resources to determine if it's a really good fit, if you think you have a viable shot at it. Again, I apologize for the delay. Um, so you have to register on SAM. And I think a lot of people sometimes don't realize that we have our own um, kind of our own version of the SAM database that's limited strictly to small businesses. Um, and this is something that James and the PTAC um, can help you out with making the most of your DSBS profile because this is limited to small businesses. SAM is just open to everybody that wants to do business with the government. The DSBS is limited to small businesses and a lot of contracting officers will use it for um, market research. So it's important to always have uh, your, your certifications, whether they're non-federal, um, your capabilities narrative. Let me advance the slide. Um, yeah, here you go. Keywords are really important as well, because some NAICS codes, uh, North American Industry Classification System codes, are very broad, right? Construction is very broad. Um, IT can be broad. So if you're more into software development or that sort of thing, or marine construction, you want to be able to include that, um, include keywords. And make sure that the contact information on the profile is up to date. Um, too often, I see profiles where the person listed as the primary point of contact has moved on from the business. So some of the, one of the uh, pieces of advice I like to give is to create a general inbox um, that one or two or everybody within the company has access to. Um, so that if there are any uh, questions coming through from that email address, it just gets to somebody. Performance history, you could also include some past performance history as well. Um, this can be a very, very useful tool. PCRs, so this is what 
Yuri and I do on the day to day. Um, all day, our, the, the basis we cover will send acquisition packages to us and what we call small business coordination forms. Um, you know, we have to concur, you know, give our non-concurrence to the overall acquisition strategy. And to that end, we review whatever we feel we need to in order to be comfortable. Um, you know, market research, responses to source aside, we can, we can pull that information, we can request that information rather. Whatever we need to do to feel that a contract can go with the proposed acquisition strategy or we can change the acquisition strategy. Um, we do have the authority to submit appeals to the acquisition strategy and say, hey, no, this needs to be, this needs to be set aside, stop what you're doing. Um, Yuri, is there anything you want to say about the, our role as, as you see it? Yeah, um, I, I think you're spot on, Aaron. It's, uh, it, we're kind of an, an unknown <laughs> position in the federal government. Most people don't realize that, that there are people um, like us who watch those contract plans behind the scenes and have any sort of say in how they're actually issued. And so um, just wanting to put out there to the small business community, there, there are people like us who do that. Um, we try very hard to do our best to protect your interests and, and uh, it supports uh, the local economies as well, which are vital. So um, yeah, that, that's why we do what we do. We enjoy it. It's not always fun, but <laughs> it, it always feels good when, good when we're able to turn something around from a full and open competition to a small business set aside. Absolutely, yeah. That's absolutely true. Um, sometimes you, if you see a set aside on um, sam.gov, there's a chance that Yuri and I or a colleague of ours had something to do with that. So, and you'll never know because it won't say, you know, this was set aside by a PCR, but we, 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 uh, we do get involved. Ah, apologize for the delay. My slide is not advancing. Let's see. There we go. Um, so we do provide training about the various small business programs. We, um, we do try to get out there and just promote our programs to not just to the agencies, but to the small business community, just like we're doing now with the, by partnering with the PTAC or with the local small business development center. Um, we assist with interpretation of regs. Um, we will just give some general counseling. Um, we will look into why an agency didn't set aside a specific opportunity for small businesses. That's where we really kind of can be useful. Um, if you as a small business see something that has not been set aside that you think should have been set aside, you can reach out to the local PCR and we can take a look at that. You know, we review thousands of acquisitions I'd like to think nothing gets by us, but occasionally perhaps something gets by us or we're just unaware. Um, so reach out if you think something should have been set aside. And sometimes the answer is, well, they didn't get a fair price or only one small business responded to the source of SOT. So that's why we let it go the way we, the way we did. Um, the rule of two was not satisfied in other words, so. And sometimes I suppose things just do get by the PCR. Not me, but other PCRs across the country. They might miss something. Um, oh, um, something on the last slide I wanted to touch on. If you wanna know who the small business specialist is for the particular base agency, um, you can let us know. We maintain a, a, a ready directory. Uh, send it out all day. Um, as a matter of fact, if you want it after this, you can just send me an email and just doesn't even have to be very long. You can just put in the subject, uh, send directory or, or please send directory if you're feeling polite. Either way, I will respond as quickly as possible. Um, with the directory of SoCal, Yuri has Oregon and Idaho as well. Uh, we work really closely with those small business specialists on the day-to-day. -day. Um, they know us, certainly. 
and they're generally pretty responsive. Although uh, caveat, this is a busy time of the year. It, in some ways, it might be better to wait until October when the madness is over and the acquisition cycle starts again. Um, but you don't have to wait. That's just some advice you can take or leave. Um, if you need any assistance with uh, protests, we can put, point you in the right direction at least. Um, and, and, and again, limitations on subcontracting, non-manufacturer rule, those are some common questions we get with, um, with the clauses and with the compliance. Um, so these are some of the things we can do to help you. Sometimes we will refer you to a PTAC or a small business development center if we think that you can be better served by the PTAC. PTACs have um, the more resources to help you one-on-one -on -one with like preparing a proposal or something like that. Um, PCRs, we also have to be a little careful in not showing favoritism because we can influence the procurement process significantly. So sometimes we will refer you out, but we can answer some general questions. Um, yeah, there's so for we, like I said, we have coast to coast coverage. Reach out to your local PCR. There is a ready directory. I always say if you just Google SBA PCR directory, it'll take you there. It'll be the first thing you see. Um, I will say that if you have a question about working with a specific agency that's located outside of where you are, um, it might be better to contact the PCR that covers that agency. For example, if um, I've had uh, questions about doing business with Army Corps Nashville. I don't, I've, I've been to Nashville once, but I don't know the Army Corps there. I don't know the small business specialist there. Um, the local PCR will know that person, will know how best to do business with Army Corps Nashville. So you might be better off contacting the PCR in Nashville. Um, just recently, I, I had another question. Uh, somebody wanted to know why something wasn't set aside for uh, an East Coast activity. Well, I sent them to the PCR on the East Coast because presumably that PCR reviewed the acquisition package. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of limited to the territory that we're in. We can give you the lay of the land where we are, but it's hard for me to tell you exactly who the major players are in Nebraska, for example. So just keep that in mind when you reach out to the PCR. And if you reach out to the wrong PCR, it's okay. We'll point you in the right direction. But just for the sake of efficiency. I am trying to advance. Oh, okay. And here's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Here is our contact info. Um, we're pretty easy to get a hold of. We're, you know, that's, my cell phone number. I'm generally pretty responsive unless I'm doing things like this. Um, sometimes I do have meetings all day. We do get busy, but um, Yuri and I are very responsive. Um, okay, great. Is, Thank you guys so much for the presentation. Um, we are going to have a Q&A, so do stick around. I just want to mention a couple upcoming events we have. If you could advance the slide one more. And sorry about the technical issues. It's a remote control thing going on with the, with the slides. Um, but this was the third event of PTAC Day. Um, next month is Women's Business Month. And so we have some uh, relevant webinars. October 4th, we have certifications for women-owned businesses. Uh, we have uh, in, in, information on the SBA general log, login system for ProNet and Subnet on October 19th. And on October 21st, we have a webinar on getting DBE certified. And um, if you could click next again, I wonder if there's one more there. Um, you can sign up for all of these. These are all free. Um, so just a little pitch on our free programming webinars coming up. Um, all right, we have some time. I'm gonna put a survey into the chat. If you guys could just let us know what you thought of our webinar today. Um, it means a lot to us, means a lot to our funders. Um, and Aaron, if you could advance the slide again. I know it's, we're having some trouble advancing slides today, but. Um, I, I find that if you double click on the screen, it will reestablish control. 
Um, all right, so we also have a WOSB certified yes. webinar that's coming up as well. You can find all of those on our calendar. Did I go too um, far? Do you, do you just, do you, do you want me to give you control, James? It, it's fine. We won't really be moving from the question slide unless we want to go back in time and then um, you guys will be in charge of that. Um, so we have a lot of questions and we are um, up against the one hour time limit. So I just wanna let folks know that um, if you have the time, stick around for the Q&A. Uh, if not, thanks for joining. Um, and uh, please enter your questions into the, in the Q&A window, not the chat. And we will be sending the slides and the video out to everyone. It's gonna be posted on our website. I'll share that link as well. Um, so uh, Aaron and Yuri, just, just let me know um, when you feel like um, any other questions should just be sent by email to your contact information or something like that. And if you, if you feel like you're running out of time. Um, so I'll dig, uh, dig right in. Um, Rick is asking, I completed SAM registration without filling the SBA information field. How do I go back and do that piece? Okay, so what I understand is that when you go through your SAM profile and update it, um, and James, you and your colleagues probably know more about this than I do, but what I've heard is there are several pages one has to go through to update a SAM profile, you're gonna to have to go through each page and click yes or confirm or whatever the, the button is to advance. You can't just go all the way to the end, but the end is where there's a link that says, click here to update your SBA profile. So um, it kind of makes you work for it, but there is a link at the very end of your SAM profile editing um, page where you can gain access to that DSBS, Dynamic Small Business Search Profile for your firm. And it's populated with um, all the information that you've put in in SAM for your, your entity, for your business. But there are extra fields there, like you kind of saw um, with the um, little screenshot images we embedded in the slides that are gonna be really useful. Um, I will tell you the DSBS profile you have needs to be in really good shape because there are many contracting officers who go to your DSBS profile first. They wanna size you up. They wanna find out what certifications you've got, but they also zoom down to the end to take a look at what your um, past performance references are. So, um, you know, Aaron mentioned trying to keep that section fairly um, up to date, um, put in current contract contacts if you can, because um, there are many occasions where a buyer will call up those prior references without you even knowing, because they, again, they want to get some more information about you before they make contact. I'm having, uh, my computer is, is sort of crashing. I can't see any meeting controls and I can't see the chat. So I might have to leave the meeting and come right back, but I, right now I can see some Q&A questions. So I'm just gonna ask one more um, and then I'll, I'll have to drop off and come back on real quick. So. Um, since uh, anonymous question here is, is since we are not certified as an 8A firm yet, can we apply for the small business set asides project as a SAM small business firm and a DBE firm? So one thing I want to point out is the DBE certification is not a federal contracting certification. That could be the state or it could be the county, but their DBE um, basically doesn't exist in federal contracting. Um, but yes, in other words, <laughs> To answer your question, if you are not an 8A firm, that does not exclude you from participating in anything that's a small business set aside or, you know, a total small business set aside. Um, sometimes you'll see 100% total small business set aside, or what we call plain vanilla. Um, no, you are not precluded from participating. 8A is just a further, um, um, something that's set aside further for that pool of applicants. Um, but Otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you're free to participate in anything else. Well, that's another reason why we also encourage you to become certified in any um, program that you are eligible for, because, um, you know, while there are usually a lot of opportunities for small businesses, occasionally you're going to see an opportunity that maybe you want to go for, but it's not set aside for something that you're currently certified in. Um, mm -hmm. An example might be hub zone. Um, perhaps your business is located in a hub zone and you meet the other requirement, which is having 35% of your employees living in a hub zone. Um, there's a 
formal application process for that through SBA that you have to go through to be HUBZone certified. Um, and you'll see some HUBZone set-asides. And if you're um, you know, just a small business, then unfortunately you won't be able to participate even though maybe you do qualify for it. It's important for you to get that certification under your belt first. Okay, great. Um, and so I left and I came back and I only have one question in my queue now. And I know that there was about 20. Um, I, I have it open, can, James. Do you just, do I hit like answer live when it's been answered? You can hit answer live. Yeah. And, and if, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, you guys can read aloud the questions. Is that all right? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Thank you. And sorry, I, I trying to make it work. <laughs> and we won't hold it against you. Um, what are the criteria for the 8A program? Yuri, you're the, you're the expert. I'll defer to you. Okay. Oh boy. There's, there's several requirements for 8A. Um, we could teach like a whole half day class <laughs> on that. Um, but essentially, uh, it has to be, of course, a small business has to be owned and controlled and managed on a day-to-day -day basis by an individual who's socially and economically disadvantaged. So we talked about social disadvantage, about being a member of particular um, racial, ethnic, or um, other groups like disabled, um, uh, maybe living on a reservation or living somewhere else that's very, very remote. Um, so if, if uh, the owner, um, at least 51% owner of the business meets those criteria, um, their economic disadvantage means that their net worth doesn't cross a certain threshold. Um, then you can apply to be an 8A firm. Um, the big reason why, the biggest reason why most firms try to get that, um, why it's such a sought after certification is because there's the opportunity, and I say opportunity, not guarantee, um, for non-competitive sole source contracts in that program. Um, I emphasize the word opportunity because it's going to, the, the, the number of opportunities there may be for you is going to depend on what kind of industry you're in, what your capabilities are, what the appetite for your type of business is amongst the federal agencies in your area. Um, so it really bears, I think, a lot of um, uh, forethought, preparation, checking things out before you put this huge effort into applying. Um, and it's currently an online application process. It does take a few months. Um, and when, in the days when it was a, a hard copy process, I can tell you, um, it, you basically have to assemble like a banker's box worth of documents. Um, business information, as well as your personal information. So we're speaking of taxes, property records, payrolls, um, any judgments or liens, um, you know, articles of incorporation for your business, how it got started. If you have multiple owners, they also have to provide some level of documentation as well. All to make sure that the people who are allowed into that program really do deserve to be in it because there are some pretty great benefits to it. And we only want the people qualified for that to get into the program. All right. Um, you know, <laughs> that was a lot of information. If you're curious, if you want to reread re it later, you can go and you, you can just Google SBA 8A criteria, you will find it. There are some nuances and we can, we can, you know, you can, you can, you may have questions after reading it, but you'll read, you'll, you'll be able to get some of the kind of firm criteria. Uh, can you explain how to find set-asides in SAM? Um, there is the ability to do a filtered search. Um, I can't tell you that it's the easiest website to use. I encourage you to work with your local PTAC if you want help and training on how to use SAM. James, am I correct? That's something you could assist with, you or, or another PTAC? Most definitely, yeah. We help folks in the, with SAM on a regular basis. So. Okay. Any PTAC should be able to help with that. It's one of our core services. There are free resources available. Free. All right. 
Um, how would I find out if there is a need for my services? I have a clothing and retail business. We offer embroidery, apparel, and various other products. And I don't know if the government could use my services. Um, that's actually a really good question. That's a very important question and something you should take into consideration before you jump into the deep end of the pool. So um, that shows a lot of foresight. So anyway, um, some, of the, some of the things that you can do are um, you can check, you can fi find out what your NAICS code is, okay? N-A-I-C-S. We, we say NAICS, North American Industrial Classification System Code. Every industry has a six-digit code. Every industry, you name it, there's a six-digit code. Um, there's one for clothing, retail, apparel. Trust me, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Um, and you can go on usaspending.gov and you can plug that in and you can see who has been purchasing um, within that NAICS code and where. Um, so that's something you can do. Now, I can't tell you that there are gonna be a ton of opportunities in this sector. You might find onesie twosie things, but you'll at least know how to target your uh, marketing efforts, right? You don't, you don't wanna target your marketing efforts to an agency that primarily does construction because they're just not gonna buy apparel. Now I can tell you that um, one of the agencies that might be useful to reach out to is um, GSA. General Services Administration. I know that there are apparel manufacturers and retailers on GSA. Um, so that might be a good resource. And as a matter of fact, let me type the name of the small business specialist um, in, in California here into the chat box, or at least one of them. They do have a team. Ah, I misspelled it. I, forgive me. There was a way to delete that one. Um, it's Caruso, not Carusa. Apologize for that, just the typo. Um, he can help you out a little bit with getting on a GSA schedule. That might be that might be your best bet. But USAspending.gov is a really useful tool for anybody. Um, it's a really good market research, market development tool. If anybody, I'll just move on. Um, how to enter keywords that are in and condition instead of or. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I, and I think there is, but I do know that there are some limitations to dynamic small business search. Um, for example, the, in the keywords. Um, so like if you put in manufacturer and they search for manufacturing, it will not come up. So it does kind of need to be, you know, bang on perfect. So you might want to go, you're better off going overboard when adding keywords. Otherwise, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, James, Yuri, feel free to jump in. You might want to try just putting in a fragment, like the first fragment of the word manufacturing or manufacturer, just put like M-A-N-U, perhaps that might broaden the results that come up. Yeah. All right. Um, can you give more examples about the small business specialist role? So in many ways, the small business specialist is sort of the first line of internal defense and creating a set aside. I don't know that that's an apt metaphor, but it's the metaphor I like to use. Um, so because they're located on site, um, they know the contracting staff, they know the technical staff, they know the requirements team, they sit in on acquisition planning meetings, acquisition boards, they create the forecast or they're, they're a part of the forecast creation. So they do a lot of work internally that we PCRs do not do because we sort of a more general overview. We work with multiple agencies across various sites where the small business specialist just works with that one. Um, they're the ones that prepare the um, acquisition coordination package for Yuri and I to review. They're the ones that we mostly dialogue with, but they're also the ones that will 
connect you and serve as a liaison for you, the small business that's interested in doing business with that base. They um, can put you in touch with the requirements team. They can, they will host industry days. They, they manage their calendar, they manage their forecast. Um, feel like there's a lot to be said about that role. It's, it's, it's a very important function and they do a lot. Um, Yuri, did I, did I miss something? Um, well, like other things that they do are, um, they're, they're really a good, good source to, or good place to send your capability statements to. Um, in fact, especially this time of year, you know, if you feel compelled to reach out, even though it's a crazy time of year for them, um, if you just are burning to, to touch base with them, I would just send them a copy of your capability statement. And that's basically um, like, like a flyer about your company with key information about it that's easily digestible for federal buyers. And the PTAX can help you uh, craft those um, nicely as well. Um, the small business specialists also can kind of give you an, an idea of what small business set aside categories they struggle in or what industries mm -hmm. they are looking for the most. Absolutely. Many times they'll do outreach where they're communicating that um, you know, in a group setting. Um, so I would you know, recommend you keep an eye out for those opportunities to attend those, but um, you know, it doesn't hurt to, to contact them one-on-one -on -one either and kind of ask them those same questions. But you could also do that research on USA spending. You can research particular um, buying locations like Corps of Engineers in Los Angeles and find out um, you know, what the typical things are that they buy. And do they usually put them out as um, well, an open competition, unrestricted, or do they usually put, set them aside for a particular group? You can find that out you know, just by mining that information on USA spending. What is the best way to go about getting micro contracts, meaning the smaller contracts? Um, a lot of those are purchased on a um, purchase card, which is what we call a, a credit card. It's essentially a credit card. Um, it's not always easy to find those because they don't need to be publicized the same way that the larger opportunities are on SAM.gov. Um, my best advice is to work with the small business specialist, um, reach out to them and, and see who is um, the head of their we call P card division, uh, purchase card division. Um, also, if you have like a product that, that can be sold on a GSA schedule, I do recommend looking into that because um, GSA in some ways functions like the Amazon for the government. You upload your products and a contracting officer can just go on the portal, search for um, t-shirts and um, find the one they're looking for, find the vendor they're looking for and just put in a quantity and buy it with a credit card. Um, a lot, like, uh, a lot like Amazon, but with more steps. So um, that's, that's a good opportunity to get some uh, micro purchases as well. Sorry, I'm not good at the Q&A thing. <laughs> I'm doing my best here. Um, any specific training or reference materials on how to search for set-asides and sources sought notices? Again, I think that's this is something that's uh, um, perfectly in line with what the PTAC does. Uh, James, do you wanna speak to this one? Um, what, what, the question is any specific training or reference materials? Yeah, on how to search for set-asides and source of SOT notices. Um, well, I'm not a procurement specialist, but I would definitely recommend looking up your local PTAC if they can sit down and help you do all sorts of marketplace research and finding opportunities. Um, as you might remember from the beginning, um, we can set you up with a bid matching profile. We'll go out and find things like that. Um, but these are, these are the pros who a lot of them are contracting officers from the past um, or government contractors from the past who've had success. So um, they know what they're doing and there's a bunch of PTACs across the country. So if you're interested, um, our website's norcalptac.org. You can see that. We also have the link for all the other PTACs across the country. So I'd recommend getting in touch with your procurement specialist. It's always free. So we'd be happy to help you find those. Again, the, the link for the PTAC is also in the chat now. Perfect. And everyone's gonna receive these, uh, these slides later and all the hyperlinks will be available for, for everyone, so. 
So I am located in New Jersey. Hello to the Garden State. Um, will there be a PCR in my area to help me set up my account on SAM? I've had difficulty in the past setting myself up. Um, there is a PCR in New Jersey, um, but the PCR may not be the best person to help you with setting up your account on SAM. That would really be, um, they, I mean, they might, they might, you can try. If you Google again, SBA PCR directory, it'll take you right to that directory and you can find who's in New Jersey. Um, I can't think of who that is off the top of my head. I, used to but anyway um your your local ptac will be able to help you with that uh, 100 no doubt probably the best person to reach out to is the uh, best organization is the ptac in new jersey how would we know if it should have been a set aside um that's a little tough uh i suppose there's no hard and fast rule but if you are a small business and this kind of acquisition that you found is something that you do and it's within reach for you, if it's you know, a, a dollar value that you can perform or you think other small businesses can you know, manage, um, then perhaps it should have been a set aside. Um, you know, the, some of the, the, the best approach I get is, hey, I'm a small business, I can do this, and I have competitors that can do this. Um, sometimes it benefits you working with your competition because if you can create a set aside, um, especially one that's like really like narrow, like a hub zone, you're playing in a much smaller pool. Um, but generally it's hard to know. That's, that's, that's true and even for us sometimes. I mean, sometimes I see things that are like a slam dunk, like a $100,000 carpet installation job that one Air Force base in particular tried to go unrestricted and tried, you know, a large business does not need to do a $100,000 carpet installation job. I'm pretty sure I could find a mom and pop that can manage that. Um, so sometimes it's a no brainer, but sometimes it is difficult. If in doubt, if it's, if it's something you can do, reach out to that PCR and let them know. Yuri, am I on the right track with that? I wanna make sure you have the opportunity yeah. to provide input. Um, sometimes the small business specialist might be someone you know, at that agency that issued the opportunity might be a good contact too, but um, you know, they may only have limited information they can provide you. Um, we're also bound to not disclose certain pieces of information that we're reviewing as well, just to try and keep the competitive process, uh, the integrity of that competitive process intact. Um, things don't always go as planned. And so if, if a project changes tack, then, then you know, information we might have shared um, in the first go around might end up being insider information later. And we don't want that to happen. So um, do know that PCRs and small business specialists um, generally try to give you as much information as we're allowed to do. And in that case, you know, talking with the small business specialist with a question like this um, could, could be helpful. And, and they'll usually go out of their way to help you as best they can, but they might also refer you to us as well, um, which we're happy to do. And, you know, if we don't, if I didn't happen to review that acquisition um, and it went full and open um, and you raised doubts about, well, you know, it could have been set aside for small business, then by golly, you know, maybe it is something that slipped my gaze and um, you know, I can talk with the um, small business specialist there, maybe the buyers and check out their market research to see if they really did do their due diligence. Um, Occasionally what happens when we, when we do that is we find that there are certain things that happened that led them legitimately to the full and open um, strategy. So let's say there was a source of sought done uh, on that acquisition and no, maybe only just one small business responded. That does not give the, the buyer, um, it, they can't satisfy that rule of two we were speaking of earlier. So, um, you know, when another small business who didn't see that source of sought comes by later and says it should have been set aside, 
you know, we have kind of the, the, the sad conversation of having to say, well, there was a source of thought that was posted and because two or more small businesses didn't respond, um, the agency didn't have grounds to set it aside. Mm -hmm. um, so then my advice would be, please, please, which this is usually my advice anyway, is always please um, watch for those sources sought opportunities, be known to that agency. Um, that way they have you on their radar. They know to count you in if they're trying to decide if rule of two is satisfied. Mm -hmm. I'm glad, glad you said that, that was really good. Uh, speakers contact, please. That will be in the slides that James will distribute. Um, related to this, how can we request a directory of buyers for pertinent agencies? So most agencies will not distribute a list of buyers. They kind of tend to safeguard the contact information for the contracting officers. The best thing to do is reach out to the small business specialist and if you don't know who that is, you can ask us. Um, and depending on what you do, they might put you in touch with the, um, with the relevant acquisition division. Um, some agencies perform a multitude of functions, so they break it out by, by division. Um, you know, like um, this is the maintenance group, this is the environmental services group, uh, this is, you know, and so on and so forth. So if, uh, if your capabilities are really in line with what they're looking for and what they do, they will put you in touch. How can we navigate to the directory? Uh, is it available on the SBA website? Um, the directory of PCRs is available on the SBA website. I, I, I gotta be honest, it's, it can be difficult to navigate to. Um, the link in the PowerPoint is live. It will take you there. Otherwise, you can really just Google SBA PCR directory. Um, it will be the first. It will be the first hit. Um, as a matter of fact, let me um, let me just maybe let me see if I can drop it into the chat box for you right now. Um, and the directory, um, the, the link that's embedded in the PowerPoint, um, you know, takes you directly to that directory that we have. It's organized by uh, location. And so you'll see kind of some hyperlinks for all six area offices of um, SBA Office of Government Contracting. But each one will then also list the states that are contained within each area. So if you click the hyperlink for the area for the state that you know you need to reach, then it'll bump you down to that part of the list. And then it's a matter of um, you know, looking for the header for the state and it'll, then it'll give you the name and contact information for the PCR that's assigned there. Uh, the rule of two is uh, what I have a question on and, and, and would like answered. So, um, Anytime an agency has a reasonable expectation that they are gonna get two or more responses from a small business on their acquisition, um, it shall be set aside, plain and simple. Um, certain criteria need to be met. The price needs to be fair and reasonable. They can't just spend an um, inordinate amount of money just because you're a small business. Um, some might give you a small percentage price preference, you know, one to 5%, let's say. But um, if the price is fair and reasonable and the firm has the capability and can demonstrate that they have the capability, and there are two of them, um, the contract should be set aside. Should be, shall be, really. Um, but there, there are exceptions, of course. There, there are some exceptions, but... Um, that's, that's what the rule of two is referring to. All right, we, we, maybe we do maybe one more question here. Uh, or two more. We, let's sure. wrap it up by 11.30. Okay. Uh, do PCRs provide training to contracting offices on how to appropriately fill out postings on SAM? Many offices neglect to fill out the place of performance, which makes it difficult for companies. Um, to actually discover the opportunity in SAM. DOI agencies are notorious for this one. Um, 
Yuri, I don't want to put you on the spot. You, you know a little bit about DOI. Yeah, yeah, that's the, um, uh, in a previous life, I was a contracting officer at DOI. So, but that was uh, a number of years ago. That's really interesting. It's the first time I've heard that. So um, we, we don't do trainings for agencies on how to um, correctly and fully fill out uh, contract opportunities on SAM. But that is something that we can definitely talk with them about and make sure that they are paying attention to it because um, as Aaron mentioned earlier, that could be a potential, um, potential barrier to the information that's valuable for small businesses in order to find those opportunities. Um, unfortunately, we're, SBA PCRs, we're not experts in SAM. Um, and that's why, uh, like with the earlier question about how to set up a SAM profile, Aaron recommended that the um, business work with their PTAC. The counselors at the PTAC get um, really great training directly from the people at SAM.gov, which is separate from SBA. Um, they get training hands-on on how to help customers, help small businesses with using SAM. And so um, that, that's kind of a whole nother knowledge base that PCRs um, don't really have. We, we delve into so many other things. We're, we're um, confident that PTAC folks can help people with that really well. So we leave it to those professionals, but um, I'm really glad to hear that, that that's, um, that's a concern. I mean, I'm sorry that that's going on, but I appreciate knowing that because then I can snoop around myself, take a look at some postings from DOI agencies and um, find examples of that my, myself. In fact, if you'd like to send me screenshots of that, um, please do to my email address. Um, and I would be happy to follow up with the agencies um, or contact the uh, appropriate PCRs who liaise with the, those particular offices and you know, see if we can get that improved. Okay, uh, oof, I think we're out of time. Uh, somebody asked about the database. I put it in the chat, usaspending.gov. Um, one thing, I, I do see another quick question about nonprofits and if they are considered small businesses. Nonprofits are not a small business. Um, feels like there's a do double negative there. Nonprofits are considered other than small, large. If you want to say that, we don't say that, we say other than small, but they're not eligible for small business assistance. Um, otherwise, I apologize if you didn't get your a question answered, you can reach out to, to the three of us and we can provide you some level of assistance. Uh, James, I'll turn it over to you. All right, yeah, and, I, and I've uh, pasted both of their contact informations, their email addresses in the chat. Um, and you'll you'll get those on the slides as well, which will include their phone numbers. Um, and if you have any questions for PTAC or PTAC services, just go ahead and give me a call, give me an email. You have a contact information on the page there. Um, and if you're in our service area, go ahead and apply for our services. Um, I believe we've pitched PTAC a couple times, so we don't need to do that again. Um, thank you, everyone. I've put a survey in the chat. Uh, I've also reminded folks a couple times. Uh, it means a lot to us if you could fill that out. Um, and uh, you're gonna be able to see the recording of this later. So if you missed any part of it, um, go ahead and check it out on our website later. So um, again, very heartfelt thanks to Aaron and Yuri. That was a really great presentation. And you guys uh, stepped up during the Q&A when I had some glitches and you did a really great job. So thank you so much for the partnership and looking forward to future times working with you. Thank you, James. All right. Thank thanks you to everyone for joining. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.